there are commonalities all around the globe, and I've, I've studied thousands of them now from every continent on earth, and yet they consistently say similar overlapping things. And my interest has always been to show how the commonalities of what they're saying aligns with what God's been revealing through the Bible for thousands of years now. That's incredible. And John, uh, you know, you've written two books on this subject. So your first book, Imagine Heaven, um, detailing near-death experiences, and now Imagine the God of Heaven, where you're studying 70 near-death experiences that people have had. You know, you've studied over a thousand people who have had near-death experiences overall, and you've used your skill as someone who's very analytical mm -hmm. <laughs> and logically minded to do that. Tell us a bit about your journey of getting into the study of near-death experiences, where you came from and, and yeah. how you got to where you are. Well, I was agnostic um, when I first encountered these. And I, I was trained as an engineer. I worked as an engineer. So my mind has always been skeptical and analytical, as you said. But my dad was dying of cancer and someone gave him the very first research that coined the term near-death experience. And I saw it on his bedside table and started reading it and I couldn't put it down. Um, because I'd always wanted to know, you know, I thought Jesus was a legend. God probably didn't exist because no one could give me evidence. And here was evidence. I mean, there were about a hundred people who were claiming the same kind of experience. And it made me say, maybe this afterlife God, Jesus stuff is real. So that opened me up to explore. And I started reading the Bible after that and, and came to faith in Jesus. But for the past 35 years, I've been trying to understand, okay, how do, the, how do these near-death experiences uh, align or misalign with the Bible? And that's been my, you know, 35 years in studying well over a thousand of them. Oh. Uh, and I'm convinced more than ever that it's incredible evidence that God is real, that God has been revealing himself uh, as the God of all nations mm -hmm. all along, and that his, his love and his grace I think he's raising up these right now as testimonies that he is the God who offers love and grace and forgiveness to all people of all nations. We were all made to be his children, to come home to him. Oh, that's so good. And you know, you mentioned you're looking for that thread of biblical truth throughout the near-death experiences that you're studying, but you're also seeing commonalities. What are some of the commonalities? Can you give us some examples of those in some of the stories? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, people typically, when they die, they leave their body, but they say they still have a spiritual body. So just like Paul talked about in 1 Corinthians 15. Um, in fact, I think Paul may have had a near-death experience when in Acts 14 in Lystra, he got stoned to death, oh. dragged out of town as dead, and then gets up and goes back into the city, <laughs> which I would not have done. <laughs> um, and later in 2 Corinthians 12, he says, 14 years ago, whether I was in my body or out of my body, I don't know. Why? Well, because we still have a spiritual body. And he said, I was taken up into heaven and I saw and heard things inexpressible. So maybe those yeah. two connect. Um, and people commonly say the things that Paul describes as well. He said, our bodies are, are buried in brokenness, but raised in, in power. Mm. Um, well, near-death experiencers talk about how they leave their bodies, but they feel more alive. Um, not just with five senses, more like 50 senses. Mm. And then they travel usually. Sometimes it's through a tunnel, but sometimes it's just out through the universe. Many times accompanied by angels. They find out of their guardian angel or angels. And they come to this place of exquisite beauty, um, not unlike the beauty of earth, but light that is love and life coming out of everything. Um, out of the trees, out of the birds, out of the flowers, out, out, even out of the people. And many people don't realize, but, but this is in the, the Bible as well. You know, in Isaiah chapter 60, in Revelation 21, it says, there's no sun or moon in heaven because God is its light. The glory of God is its light. Jesus, the lamb, is its lamp. And the nations will walk in that light. Mm. And Jesus said in Matthew 13, and then the righteous will shine like the stars in their, in their father's kingdom forever. And what it turns out that I show in my books is that this, this light is the light of God that is the glory of God, which is love and life, all is one. 
and it comes out of everything. It gives life to everything. And so that's part of, I think, of the reward we get to share in. Yeah. That we get to experience something of the life and the love of God coming out through us. Mm. Maybe in proportion to how much we let it show in this life. I don't know. <laughs> That's beautiful. You know, John, um, you know, in Imagine the God of Heaven, there are so many stories, 70 stories of people who have had near-death experiences. And I can't help but wonder, you know, as before I started reading a lot of these stories, would these people have considered themselves spiritual or followers of Jesus before they died? Or tell us a little bit more about some of those stories and if these people were quite spiritual prior to their passing yeah. for those moments of their near-death experience. Yeah, because I really see this as evidence. I mean, almost like proof of God's existence yeah. because many of them did not expect the God they discovered. Mm. And so I'm showing 70 people from every continent. Um, Santosh was a, a Hindu, uh, grew up Hindu, he's a manufacturing engineer code blue, his heart stops. He said this brilliant God of light that he knew as a divine light comes and takes him on this journey. And he said, I fell in love with this light. Mm. And then the light stops over what he ends up describing to me um, as this giant square shaped compound with high walls and 12 beautiful gates. He counted them, he said. And he, he had no biblical knowledge, but he is exactly describing Revelation 21, where John sees the holy city of God. And then he sees God Almighty on his throne. And though those 12 gates were closed to him, a very narrow gate that is open into the kingdom of heaven, and he longed to go in. Mm. And he comes back seeking this God that he said was, was not like the gods he had learned about. This God that was love and compassion and mercy, even though he saw his life review and he saw all his sins and he saw I'm guilty and yet God offered him forgiveness and mercy as he cried out to him so there's story after story like that he comes back and he starts reading the Bible and he said everything I experienced was in here and became a follower of Jesus wow. but when you have Bibi in Tehran who experiences the same God that Santosh did who says to her I am he who is Mm. which is exactly what this God of brilliant light said to Moses on Mount Sinai, right? Yes. I am the I am, yeah. the God who is and was. And then um, Swadik and a mom in Rwanda. A Muslim imam. A Muslim imam dies of blood cancer and his mother was desperate. The, the Muslims had prayed and didn't heal him. She went to her family goddess, Bako, couldn't heal him. Finally, she goes to the Christians at the Anglican church to pray in Jesus' name. And she's praying in Jesus' name. And Swadik actually starts off in this hellish place, but into it comes this man of light, he said, brighter than the sun, but he's wearing a robe and he holds out his hands and Swadik sees holes in his hands. And he had seen the passion of the Christ when it came to Rwanda. And so he said, I knew who this was. And he said to him, I died for mankind. You are among those I died for. Never deny it and tell it to everyone. Wow. Swadik wakes up. He comes to at his burial saying, Jesus has brought me back. He brought me back. <laughs> and all these Muslims just freak out, yeah. right? But today, Swadik has had, he's, he's an Anglican pastor and he's had seven attempts on his life because he will not shut up about Jesus. And I have 70 stories like this from every continent of people who should not have encountered this God of light and love who they discovers to be one with Jesus. Um, even like uh, a 16 year old Jewish girl who was told that Jesus is the biggest hoax ever, but when her horse lands on her and she finds herself dead 30 feet up above her body, a brilliant light over her shoulder, she looks and she said, there was Jesus and I knew him. And so again and again, and then Jesus takes her to the father. So she, as a 16 year old girl, 
experiences the triune God, she had no biblical knowledge about that or understanding. No, and indeed, even in the Jewish culture, often if you convert out, which is what they would consider that, uh, they would sit shiva for you, hold a funeral for you. So she's risking so much by even coming back and saying, I encountered Jesus. And that's what I'm trying to point out. That's why I think this is such incredible evidence that there is only one God and this God has always had a plan for all nations. Mm -hmm. So he, he's not just the Christian North American God, he is the God of all people. And that's what I'm trying to show as well, that he is loving beyond what we can even, I mean, I interviewed this one um, uh, neurologist, psychiatrist who was stabbed 13 times. He showed me the, the stab wounds, the scars in his neck. Um, one of his patients had a psychotic break and turned on him. And he talked about how the, this brilliant God uh, of light appeared to him. He said, it would be like standing five feet from a nuclear explosion. That's what the power of this light was. But he said, but what was even more powerful was the love. And he described, he said, this love, our word love just doesn't even compare. He said, you know, take all the loves you've ever experienced, put them into one point in time and then multiply it by millions. And, and that's the love God has for you. And it's a unique love. You know, that, that's the other thing, Laura, that um, interviewing CEOs and doctors and lawyers, and these are people who had a lot to lose making up wild stories about dying and seeing God. Right, yeah. But consistently they say it was the most real thing in their lives. And consistently they say, you know, when I was with him, and they would say like, I knew it wasn't true, but I felt like I was the only one he loved. <laughs> like I was his unique child. And, and this is something that I think people just don't understand is that, you know, we, we who know Jesus sometimes think we know God, yeah. but we all put God in a box. We're finite, we have to. God is so much greater than we've ever imagined, but he's also so much more relatable mm. and personable and gets us and even fun and enjoyable. So, you know, that, that hits the walls of a lot of people's box. God, fun, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, who do we think created us to be able to enjoy life and have fun? <laughs> yeah, if we're made in his image and we can have fun and laugh. Why would we think he's less than us? <laughs> he's and I show it. more fun. <laughs> and in the, well, in the book, I, I show it through the eyes of these people. Yeah. But you know, many times we just don't realize this is what God's revealed about himself. Jesus last night on earth, you know, he said, um, I've told you these things so that you, so that my joy would be in you and your joy would overflow. And when people are in the presence of God, they do experience this overflowing joy. Yeah, that's incredible. You know, John, I know so many of our viewers are stirred up right now because it's really exciting and it's, it, it's insightful what you're sharing about these experiences people are having with God when they, when they have near-death experiences and they come back. Um, and we're touching on love and, and, and you know this incredible essence of who God is. Of course, a lot of our viewers watching, you know, they are praying grandparents and mothers and fathers. And in your book, you touch on some of these prayers that mothers have prayed for their sons and the difference it made as their sons experienced near death experiences. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about the power of prayer and I know it will motivate us to keep praying. Yeah. Yeah, this was one of the things, there, there were many things that kind of shocked me and, you know, I wasn't expecting, but interviewing so many of the people, when, when you see a consistency, then you kind of go like, wow, okay. Um, and one of them is that prayer is tangible in heaven. Uh, so many of them talked about how they, they saw the prayers, in some cases, like Jim Woodford, a Canadian commercial airline pilot who didn't know God, when he died, he cried out in the last minute, but his wife was praying for his salvation. And when she heard, when the Canadian uh, Royal Mounted Police came and told him that he's, he's dead, um, she gathered with six of her family members, they held hands and they prayed. Well, at that moment, Jim had been rescued because he had cried out to God last minute. 
And he was there in heaven and he looked up in the sky and he saw six streaks of light going up. And he said to the angel, what are those? And the angel said, those, Jim, are the prayers of your family for your salvation right now going to the throne of God. And, you know, Laura, it's amazing. But in in the book, there are three other men who who died who and, and they died and their their mothers had been praying for their salvation, but they didn't know. Um, one of them was uh, Ian, a surfer who uh, died from box jellyfish stinging him. And as he was in the ambulance, his mother was in New Zealand and woke up in the middle of the night, pray for Ian, he's in trouble. And she's on her knees praying. And Ian is, is thinking, I'm dying, you know, what should I do? And he heard, pray to God. And he's like, I don't believe in God, what God? You know, Buddha, Kali, what? And then he thought, you know, well, my mom prayed to Jesus. And he said, well, I don't even know what to pray. And the words of her mother started, his mother started coming back, praying the Lord's Prayer. And when he got then, he had a near-death experience. And there he was in the presence of this brilliant God of light who he realized was Jesus. He found out it was at that moment that that God washed him clean of all his wrongs, all his sins. Mm. And, you know, another one who died in a, a guy who died in a drug overdose and his mother had been praying for him and he's in a hellish experience. So hellish experiences are just as encountered as heavenly ones yeah. in these near death experiences. But God is merciful and he, he hears our, our cries. And um, Ivan said he was in this hellish experience when he hears a booming voice say, Release him, it is not his time. His mother has been praying for him. She's prayed over 20,000 prayers for him. You must let him go. Well, it definitely makes me emotional, John, as a, as a mom of two sons. And they've both given their hearts to the Lord, but you know what, I can't help but think of the other moms who are on those journeys praying for their kids. And it's incredible when we think about the, the role we can play in, in helping people come to faith in Jesus and, and changing their reality. Well, and you know, it, I mean, it sounds, I, I think about myself as a skeptic on the other side listening to this and I'd be going like, oh, whatever, yeah. you know, <laughs> I would. <laughs> and, and, but that's why in the book, I tried to show you the evidence because yeah. then you start to realize, wow, okay, God is far greater than I ever imagined. Yes. You know, we, we, we say, how could he hear billions of prayers? Because he's God. And the life he has to come for us is so far greater than we've ever imagined. And I hope it helps people want to seek him, mm. just like I did. You know, that it opened my mind. And when I started to seek, I, I really did find, oh, there's something not only true here, but good. And that is your heart for this book, John. Imagine the God of heaven. This book is more about God than it is about heaven or eternity in a sense. You want to encourage people to seek God. And that's your greatest hope, isn't it? Because as I subtitled it, God is the love you've always wanted. Yes. Like what we don't realize is all of the relationships we have on this earth, they're a microcosm of a greater relationship that we were meant for. Yeah. And when you're right there, then all of our relationships go deeper. They don't go less, they go deeper. Here on this earth and forever in eternity. That's so powerful, John. I'm so thankful you've written this book and that you've joined us today. Thank you so much for your time with us. Oh, it's been